Welcome to the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Arts Art Hour podcast, where we talk about art, history, and everything in between. Today, I am joined by Dr. Kate Liska and with Erica Kelly, and we're going to be talking about women in ancient Egypt. So some brief introductions. I feel like I'm introducing you guys to yourselves, but <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Um, so Dr. Kate Liska, she's been the Benson and Pamela Hare Feller, Fellow in Egyptology, um, as well as an Associate Professor of History here at DSUSB. And we also have Erica, she's a fellow Rathma student assistant. Um, she's a fourth year history major and her focus is on ancient Egyptian birth. So thank you guys for joining me. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and kind of get started. Um, so normally what I like to do before we get really into like the, into the bulk of the conversation, what I like to do is to establish kind of like a baseline of understanding definitions, you know, that kind of thing. So we all kind of have the same background knowledge. So. I think before we start talking about, you know, what women did, what their lives were like, you know, what rights they had and that sort of thing, I think it's kind of important to understand how we know that in the first place. Um, so maybe, uh, Kate, you can kind of start us off. Um, what do we, how do we learn about women through archaeology and things like that? Like what clues did they leave behind for us to kind of unravel? That's a great question. I always like contextualizing what we're talking about first, too. So thank you um, <laughs> for all of you students out there. That's one of the tricks to learning history. Um, anyway, so to learn about women in ancient Egypt, we have three primary types of evidence, all of which come with their own strange caveat to them. So first we have archeological remains, right? Things that the Egyptians actually left behind. And that can range from an actual burial of an Egyptian woman to um, a tomb that was built for her or the house that she lived in, the artifacts that were left behind and a range of other things too. Um, and that gives us a lot of information about daily life and also daily practices of death, I guess you would say. Um, in addition to that, we have textual evidence. So things that are written about women. Uh, the problem with those things is that most of them are usually written by men. So things like instruction texts where a father is telling his son about women in the world. It's coming very much from a male perspective, um, but you can parse out some of the details. However, we do have a couple of letters or wills that are actually written either by women or from women and then just transcribed by a man that actually give a more insightful perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is through art. So pictures of women, uh, again, those are usually made by craftsmen that come with a very stylized perception of an idealized woman or an idealized genre of art. Um, so again, it comes with caveats of how do we use this to really understand the female experience in ancient Egypt, but there are ways to do it. You can actually parse apart those types of images to hopefully get some clues about the world. Mm -hmm. And then of course, this is 5,000 years of history and millions of millions of women. So right. no one woman is gonna be the same as the other. It's always gonna be a little different depending on who you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like it's important to have all those different perspectives because no one perspective you know, gives a whole you know, complete answer. So by looking at it from all those different lenses, it's kind of like, like all the pieces of a puzzle kind of coming together is kind of what it sounds like. Exactly, mm -hmm. creating the complex history or what people are now saying, unboxing history. Uh -huh. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Erica, when we were kind of like setting up for this podcast, um, you mentioned that there were these paddle dolls. Yes. Um, so maybe you can kind of, maybe we can use those as kind of like the first artifact that we can kind of talk about. So do you want to kind of talk about what paddle dolls were, their meaning, you know, that kind of a thing? Yeah, so paddle dolls are these really cool like wooden figurines almost they're really like flat and they are humanistic in a way that they have like a head and arms but they don't always have legs they're more like bell shaped or like um oval shaped in the bottom um some of them i think have also been found with like beads that are supposed to represent hair and they're also like really finely decorated either with like a very pronounced like pubic area or just like little dots that could possibly be tattoos um, originally, a lot of Egyptologists, I believe, thought that they were like concubines. They're supposed to represent concubines and they were found in tombs. So they were supposed to gratify some kind of sexual aspect of the afterlife or provide that in the afterlife. But other um, research has come up where they might actually, they're probably not concubines and have a more religious um, meaning for them or like ritualistic meaning to them. Um, one thing that I like to think about is like the idea of rebirth. So these 
not at all could be something tied to fertility and ensuring that these people were reborn, just like you need fertility figures in human life to have these children and be fertile, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so just, can I expand on the paddle yeah. dolls? Okay. Paddle dolls are very cool. But one, a couple of caveats to mention about them is that they, they're only around for about 200 years and only in a couple of places and, and a little bit of time. So they're primarily in Thebes and then also a couple of other cities from about 2000 BC to about 1700. Um, and they are strange. They've been a big debate. I mean, originally a lot of older Egyptologists, um, used to, as Erica mentioned, think that they were concubines or something for sexual gratification in the future. But a lot of recent work by Ellen Morris, especially, and other people have demonstrated that, no, 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 they might not have been. And her argument is really cool. She actually argues that all of these dolls are, in fact, dancers, Henner dancers, that are meant to help the deceased person get reborn into the afterlife by doing their dance. Um, it's it uh some people believe her other people don't uh, i'm sure you know next week there'll be another article um but it is really you know getting away from the overly simplistic and m mildly misogynistic idea <laughs> right. that you know like these figures are solely concubines but that of course did come out in like 1920 so that kind of makes mm -hmm. sense right like we're moving forward in their conceptualizations but they're in tombs not just of women they are in tombs for men um and I don't know, a lot of them were purchased on the market, so I don't know if we actually know if they're in the tombs of women too or not, but you know, they are images of women showing the power of women to help people be reborn in the afterlife, even if those people happen to be male. Mm -hmm. So um, I think Erica, you mentioned that these paddles had like little dots on them mm -hmm. um, that were supposed to symbolize tattoos. Um, so mm -hmm. were tattoos, this can go for either of you, I don't know who wants to take it first, but um, were tattoos common in ancient Egypt and did both men and women have their, or is it just like a certain class or group of people who were able to get tattoos? Yeah, so tattoos are not super common in ancient Egypt and there's only been one male that's been found with tattoos and that's Ginger and I think he's on display at the British Museum. Um, but they've actually been found mainly on women and the tattoos that have been found on them are very like religious. Um, I think like Dr. You haven't mentioned it yet, but um, <laughs> you're talking about how there's um, lotus things or not lotus, but like lotus, lotus flowers flower. or the eye of Horus or the Wajit eye on, uh, not the Wajit eye, but the eye of Horus on like a woman's neck. So again, they're more tied to women and they could be tied to like a priestly class of women or um, like a woman working in the tombs or not the tombs, in the temples and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. If you want to take a question. Yeah, so the work on tattoos has been really cool. And anybody who's listening that wants to know more, look up Anne Often's work. It is amazing. Um, she's really become the expert on women and tattoos in ancient Egypt. And again, um, taking it out of this, you know, like 1920 misogynistic world of women, you know, they used to think, oh, anybody who had a tattoo was clearly uh, an undesirable concubine woman. But this is not true at all. Uh, especially, you know, see Anne's work and a lot of other things that have happened in the last 20 years. Um, but it really is a new field from the last 20 years, especially because people who study bodies are now using infrared photography to look at them, which they didn't always do before. And like tattoos are showing up. So they're becoming slightly more and more and more common. Mm -hmm. But it's still really weird because they're only on women except for this pre-dynastic mummy in the British Museum. But he's even thousands of years earlier. So mm -hmm. there are thousands of years difference between the bulk of them. And it seems like a lot of these women are somehow connected to the priesthood again, or being priestesses, and that these tattoos are magically making their words and their actions become real. So for instance, as Erica was mentioning, one of the women has this wajid eye like tattooed on her neck. And the idea is, is that as she speaks, this magically makes anything coming out of her voice box even more magical. But it still would have been really painful to get. <laughs> right, I'd, I'd imagine that does not seem like a comfortable place. Um, and this is just more of like, for my own personal knowledge, I'm not an expert in ancient Egypt, um, ancient Egypt in general, I guess. So is there a difference between the Wajit Eye and the Eye of Horus, or is it just two names for the same thing? <sighs> It is mildly different. Yeah. Okay. So 
So there are various stories because you have the eye of Horus and the eye of Ray, and they are the left eye and the right eye, and they get lost. It's a big tale about how Thoth has to go off and find them. So like the eye of Horus and the eye of Ray are the right eye and the left eye, and they are connected very much to this myth. Um, the Wajet eye is only ever the left eye. Well, no, sometimes it's the right eye too, but... <laughs> But it is a hieroglyph that you often will put onto coffins or onto stele that essentially, or even in necklaces too, that mm -hmm. allow the spirit or the deceased to see out. So if it's on the edge of a coffin, it, it's thought that the mummy can see through it and watch the world around mm -hmm. it. So yes, they're different, but they still look so similar that they often get confused. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I, that was something I didn't know. Um, so we're kind of talking about, you know, how we learn about women in, you know, ancient Egypt through, you know, archaeology and stuff like that. And one of the main main motifs that we see is this idea of suckling. Um, so why do we see so much of that in archaeology and kind of like what's the significance of that? So I don't know, Erica, if you'd want to take that one. Yeah, so suckling is um, very prominent, like you said, and it's usually a image or like a artifact of a divine deity or like Isis or someone like that suckling either like Horus or the new king or the, um, the king as a child and it's supposed to be kind of like a way to further divinize or um, like make him make the king godly because since the person who is suckling and like breastfeeding the king is a goddess she's giving her like divine bodily fluids to him and then just further solidifying the fact that he is the son of a goddess and he has like her goddess in him kind of thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the role of the mother is very important when it comes to divinity. And we see that in the suckling scenes, especially, um, but then also with um, the raising of the king, Horus, or whoever the living king is as a child. And this goes into so many different venues. And there are a lot of goddesses that are shown suckling. It's not always Isis, like Hathor does it a lot too. And <laughs> Hathor is often also connected with a tree, the sycamore tree. So there are these weird vignettes of like a tree with a breast and a king <laughs> drinking from it. Um, but you have to understand this is Hathor and she's getting both connotations of the milk and, and the sycamore coming through. And so it's the same idea of the mother divinity coming through. But we know that this is not just for the king and more for divinity because it goes beyond royal, uh, ro royalty too. So for instance, there's a whole class of animal gods in ancient Egypt. Not all gods in, or not all animals were gods in ancient Egypt, but they did have a select few. So for instance, if they had a bull god like the Apis bull, right? Um, one bull was deemed the living God on earth. Not all cows, not all bulls, but like one. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that guy got, you know, to live in his bull palace and be buried like a bull king. Um, and it's, it's actually really cool because when the previous Apis would die and they would bury him like a god, right? Then they would go out into the countryside and look for the next Apis, because it's not all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there, you know, Herodotus tells us these things about how like they were told to go out and look for a black bull with the image of a white eagle on its side, and that would be the new Apis bull. It's kind of like looking for the Dalai Lama, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they go and they find it. But when they find this new calf, they don't just make him divine. They also make his mom divine. Mm -hmm. So they go and grab the female uh, cow too. And she gets to also live out her life as divinity because she nursed him. She made him. Thus, she must also be divine. Mm -hmm. So there is a real power in women. Right. And then rest of the cows were eaten as normal. But <laughs> <laughs> still. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I guess we can now kind of talk about, we kind of talked about, you know, the divine and how like there's such an important on importance on women especially with you know when they're when we're talking about you know god goddesses and you know just that whole you know that relationship between like mother and child um so kind of using that as like a i guess a diving board um i guess we can kind of switch to talking about the role of women as they were royals because we have to understand you know there's a big difference between like your common woman who you know just lives like in a normal house in a normal city you know doing like a normal Egyptian life, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big difference between, you know, a woman who lives in a palace. So what was life like in terms of, you know, your rights or, you know, what privileges you were allowed? And I guess 
how you compared to your male counterpart? What was like, what was life like for women? Um, so for like more everyday people, it was very, com not very common for them to just stay in the house, but they do have, we find the title mistress of the house very often. And that's not just for common people, that's also for elite women, but it does kind of reiterate the idea that women were dominant and kind of controlled the house. So they were in charge of like cooking and taking care of the children and doing all those kind of things. But that doesn't mean that they weren't able to go out and do other things. Like they're also very commonly seen as weavers or sewers. Um, there is this one example found in, where is it? I forget where it is, but it's Reni's, her name, it's an elite person and her name is Reni Seneb. And, Reni um, Seneb Adebayos. Adebayos. She is um, a, an elite woman. And we find, not we, but Joseph Wagner. The daughter of the king. Yeah, the daughter of the king. But she <laughs> married, married a mayor. A, yeah, married a mayor. Um, so in like this household of like the mayor's household, there's a specific quarter or like room where we find, not we, archaeologists find a lot of seals, like clay or seals or stamps that have her name on them. So that kind of makes archaeologists believe that she was actually in charge of some kind of like importing or exporting or some kind of business in a way because all these seals are attached to her name specifically not her husband's not um, like her father's it's her name specifically so that shows that yeah they were household people and they were supposed to take care of the house but they were able to go out and do more things mm -hmm. than just that and there's even instruction text remember as i mentioned before the directions of a father telling his son like how to act in this world um, kind of like Polonius talking to Laertes in Macbeth. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, Hamlet. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I made a Shakespeare error there. Um, anyway, so uh, so one of these instruction texts actually talks about how um, you're supposed to let your wife alone in her house. Like, don't tell her how to keep the house. Don't tell her where to put things. Don't you you know this is her space. Let her control it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't intercede. Let her be herself here. So, like, they're actually getting that advice, and it's matched in the archaeology, too. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Awesome. So that's kind of like the perspective on, you know, the common woman. Um, was that true, too, for, you know, women who were royalty? Like, did they have kind of control about the inner workings of the palace, or was their role kind of different? Um, it was kind of different. So the king, he was able to marry a lot of women, or not a lot, but they would have multiple wives. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't his principal wife or his, um, the gods, not the gods royal wife, what's the other one? Great royal the wife. The great royal wife. Um, you kind of just lived in the women's quarter and had his children and were taken care of and done like over there. But the principal wife or the great royal wife, she had a more like social, ritualistic, religious role that she also had to take part of. So, um, in since the king is a god she's also a god in a sense and she's in charge of giving birth to the next king who is also a god so they form the divine triad um the triad um she also just had more ritualistic expectations to uphold as well if that makes sense yeah it does yeah so the king has lots of different wives just as erica was mentioning and one was higher up and it was usually the great royal wife's male child that would become the next king of egypt and, and so she would be set apart from everybody else there are a couple of occasions where like the king seemed to pick a number two wife and give them a different title like most beautiful one or something <laughs> like that and so they get this other epithet and it's like there's my number two but then you get to the next king and that you know that superficial title goes away and it goes mm -hmm. back to being the great royal wife and then the rest of the harem but those women and, and harem is a bad term again it's something coming out of the 1920s again but it's these female quarters and um and yeah like we actually know a little bit about those we found them archaeologically there seems to be some images of them in different types of paintings we found them in edges of palaces like at the great palace at, at amarna um and even there's this really cool letter um we have this really awesome set of international correspondence between kings and queens called the amarna letters in the uh around you know like 13 1400 bc um so the new kingdom um 
And this one king, Amenhotep III, writes, I believe the king of Babylon, and he's like, hey, can you send me your daughter to marry? Uh, I should step back for a minute. So of course, kings have multiple wives, but there are multiple ways you take them. So sometimes you would um, marry your sister. Uh, that keeps the bloodline royal, keep it in the family. That person's usually going to be the great royal wife, um, although that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you do marry for love, um, but a lot of times you marry for politics, right? right. A lot of uh, diplomatic marriages, probably on par with what you see at medieval Europe, you know, uh -huh. like uh, where kind of everybody's a little related. Uh, anyway, so they, so the king of Egypt writes to, I believe the king of Babylon, and is like, hey, can you send me your daughter? I just became king. I'd like to, you know, solidify our diplomatic marriage. She can become my wife. And then the king of Babylon writes back, and he's like, uh, excuse me, no, because my sister went and married your dad, and nobody's heard from her in years, and we don't know what happened to her. And, you know, like, like where's my wife? You know, where'd my sister go? We haven't heard anything. Like, is she, is she actually okay? We have no knowledge. And then the king of Egypt retorts again in another letter and basically is like, what are you talking about? She's fine. She's over there. You guys never sent anybody appropriate to go check on her. The one person you sent down here in the last 10 years was like a donkey driver. He doesn't count. He doesn't uh -huh. know what he's talking about. So the, the point is, is that the previous diplomatic marriage wife was fine. Like she was just living out her life, doing whatever she does um, in the back rooms of the palace and she was well treated. Um, and there are some other diplomatic marriage wives like Tutmosis III married three women of, um, of Syria, the three Syrian princesses. And even though they were all lesser wives, they were actually buried in a tomb and have beautiful jewelry that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, with like gazelle diadems and mm. and uh, all made out of gold. So like these are the lesser royal wives, right? And they were still, you know, treated pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, although you did have to share your husband with a bunch of other people. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is kind of a point that's come up, I think about twice right now is just like something to address is, you know, when we do like at, look at history, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're putting our current context on it, kind of how you mentioned, like, you know, the term harem or like the negative concept of tattoos, you know, those all came from the 20s. And so it's just like a note to think about, you know, whenever we do look at history, you have to understand that it's coming from our viewpoint, whether mm -hmm. it's even not, not just for ancient Egypt, like when we talk about like prehistoric or other worlds or not worlds, other areas of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's just something to note that, you know, we have to understand that our view isn't going to be 100% accurate because we're looking at it with our perspectives. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the views and goals of archaeologists and historians and a lot of scholars have, and scientists in particular, have changed so much in the last century, right? I mean, you were coming from the 1920s, 1930s, where it was common and normal to look for, you know, um, white people being smarter by scientists based mm -hmm. on you know brain size or based on whatever measurements you want to take of course that is all totally terrible and wrong right <laughs> right um but they were doing it for real in the 1900 and 1930s and the data that we have from them that we still have to use because they were the ones that excavated the tombs a lot of times or they were the ones that excavated these burials or decided to keep certain artifacts over other artifacts they were recording with a different intention than mm -hmm. we have to look at them for. But there are still lots and lots of ways that modern historians can look at the old evidence, disregard those terrible, terrible ideas, and then still use it to understand the past. Right. Um, but they have to know to do that, mm -hmm. you know, in, in many ways. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just... I. Quick tangent, you know, just to address. Um, so yeah, that's not really about women, is it? No, it's just like, you know, history overall and, you know, the, the philosophy of history and what our job is in interpreting it. Um, so going back, um, you kind of mentioned that um, if you're like married to like a king or a pharaoh or something, you kind of had your own little tomb that went along with his. Um, and that's something that we see in the Great Pyramids as well, right? So it's not just, you know, the main three, there's like a complex around it is kind of I think what we're getting at, mm -hmm. right? 
Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> exactly. So a pyramid is never just a pyramid. It's always a pyramid complex with like nine different parts, including multiple temples, sometimes a causeway, and then also smaller pyramids um, that are either called satellite pyramids or subsidiary pyramids. Um, and there are usually three on one, three on the east. Uh, uh, yeah, they're on different sides. Um, and then the question is, is what are these smaller pyramids for? Um, and a lot of times people will think that they are for the burials of royal women in particular. And we know that a lot from places like Lisht, where we have um, a pyramid of kings and then we have princesses who were actually buried in these subsidiary pyramids, specifically like the, the tomb of Sid Hathor unit. I believe that she was in one of these subsidiary pyramids like right next to her father. Need to double check that. Um, and although her tomb had been robbed, the people who excavated it actually ended up finding this giant cache of jewelry, just outstanding gold and amethyst and beautiful jewelry that's now on display in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art also, um, that went with her being a royal woman. Um, and she's not the only one. I mean, there's Mararet and a lot of other ones who's just caches of gorgeous jewelry. Like they really, um, deck these ladies out well. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah. kind of switching gears a little bit. I feel like that's what we're doing this whole <laughs> podcast, just like, you know, switching gears. But um, we did also mention that, you know, a king would have multiple wives and, you know, there's kind of like not a ranking system, but, you know, some are more important than others, especially like if you gave birth to the son, that's going to be the next ruler in line. So I guess my next question is, is talking about that birth process. And this is going to go mm -hmm. towards Erica because, you know, this is your your specialty. So mm -hmm. what was it like giving birth in ancient Egypt? Well, like the actual process of giving birth doesn't really change that much throughout history. It's very like, it's you biological. Birth, how, yeah, yeah. It's biological. <laughs> um, but like the process and like, not the process, but the steps leading up to it and the rituals behind it do kind of change. And we also see this change throughout ancient Egypt. Um, so like techniques used in the Middle Kingdom aren't necessarily used in the um, New Kingdom or the Old Kingdom and those kind of things. But um, one explanation I like, not explanation, but one Egyptologist's like explanation of what happens is Joseph Wagner. I don't believe him or I don't agree with him 100%, but the way he describes it, because he actually in Abydos, he found this brick and he calls it a birth brick and it's this mud brick brick <laughs> that is is really um, finely decorated with a bunch of different um, either animal imagery that are connected to um, like birth deities and those kind of things. There's also um, a woman on it giving or decorated on it giving birth. So what he thinks happened is you would have these birth bricks and before the woman gave birth, you would do some kind of like spell or ritual over them so that they would be magically endued with different like powers from goddesses. One of them was most likely Mescanet because she is actually the um, personification of a birth brick. Like her name is birth brick. And like mm -hmm. she's sometimes seen with like a brick at the head. Uh -huh. so she, she's the birth brick. <laughs> um, so you would ha he thinks that you would have like four of them, mm -hmm. um, which could go back to some other reasons. But he says you'd have four of them and you'd have um, do a spell over them. and. So they'd be endued with the power of the goddesses and then you'd have protection for them. So when it was actually time to give birth, you would have the woman who's pregnant and you would stack these bricks on top of each other, so two on two, and the woman would either kneel on them, um, like still standing up, because standing up makes it easier to give birth because the woman's still doing all the work, but gravity's helping it. Um, so you'd either like kneel on it, some people, I guess, have argued that you'd actually stand on them as well, but that would be very hard, I feel like, to get a pregnant woman on there and then also stand her, stand, or help her, like, stand. Um, so she'd be kneeling on these bricks, and then she'd be assisted by um, one person probably, like, helping hold her up, and then another person trying to catch the child. And then you'd also have another person um, doing more rituals and saying spells or um, asking the gods for protection, using specific um, artifacts, like, we have these really cool... Um, wands that um, they're not made. What are they made? What are they ivory. Made? Ivory. Yeah. Hippo ivory. I could. I was thinking elephant, but there's no elephants. <laughs> well, they, they can get elephants in, if they go to Africa, and there are images of elephants. But they have hippos everywhere. So hippos yeah. are 
hippo ivory is much more common. Uh -huh. And they would also be decorated with um, different birth deities and different type of birth imagery. So you'd be using these artifacts however they were used. And then you would give birth and then it would be successful. You'd like yay and then the woman would enter this period like this 14 day period of cleansing what actually happened during that cleansing we don't necessarily know we do see it's mentioned in the tales of wonder when the three kings of the old um, kingdom are born um, it says that their mother enters a period of 14 days of cleansing but then we also have them at Deir el medina yeah Deir el medina where um, there are these household altars that have depictions of they're like broken pieces of the wall that show these women sitting in specific areas where they have their child sometimes the child is held by someone else but they also have um a like not a servant but like a helper with them either like doing their hair or bringing them gifts and those kind of things so like i said we don't necessarily know why it's the 14 okay. days or what they're doing but that's kind of like the gist where you'd have the ritual preparing for the birth birth and then cleansing right and so these bricks were they like our family bricks that get passed down or whether like communal bricks or how much do we know about those? Well, from the brick that Wagner found is from Reni Seneb, so she's an elite person. So hers is very finely decorated. Mm -hmm. So that's and one of the reasons why is most likely because she was an elite person. Um, but in just it is a mud brick right. that they would use that the Egyptians would use to build their houses and those kind of things. So it's not entirely difficult to get them. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not you could decorate them is up to debate, but anyone could go and get one brick. And then as long as you say the spells and do the spells right, you still have the same concept of, it's not decorated and you don't see the imagery, but I have given this brick, like the spells and the power to do what it needs to do. Um, so anyone could have it, mm -hmm. but then there are some people who argue that since hers was finally decorated that they might belong to like a chief midwife of the village or right. like of the larger area and then they would bring theirs specifically but that kind of depends on whether or not because wegner also thinks that after the woman gave birth you would use the birth bricks to um, have the baby sleep on mm -hmm. so that they would still have the protection of the ch of the goddesses um so obviously if you think that everyone's going to have their own set of bricks right. but if you don't think that then it's like oh it's more communal i can give it to my daughter or i can give it to my cousin who's also giving birth like those kinds mm -hmm. of things yeah that, that's what i was just imagining that situation in my head I'm like hey can i borrow it next weekend <laughs> like no sorry it's going to my cousin you yeah i'm taking like in a few days that's just <laughs> an interesting thought um wouldn't want to have a shortage of bricks. That could be bad. No. <laughs> um, so kind of um, on that note, just talking about, you know, like marriage and family structures within Egypt, um, what was it like to be, I guess not to be married. I mean, like, that's kind of like, I feel like even couples today could talk to you about like what it's like to be married, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like the actual marriage process, is it how we know it today where it's like you find this person and it's this whole legal process or a religious process and, you know, there's, you know, this whole shebang that goes on or is it more kind of like two people cohabilitating yeah it's definitely more of like the second one it's def marriage isn't like how we think of marriage there's no government paper or anything that you have to sign um i don't think the word like to take husband appears if i'm remembering correctly it doesn't appear to like the new kingdom so it's much more of like a social concept and construction kind of thing where do you want to but I was just going to say, that. <laughs> sorry, uh, I was just going to say that you, you are correct. Um, but the, the word that they usually do is to establish a house, right? Gotcha. And so, you know, you have this idea of like, you become married when you just start cohabitating mm -hmm. and like, it's socially accepted. There wasn't mm -hmm. any giant marriage wedding ritual. There was definitely marriage. It just didn't come with a wedding at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually know very little about dowries or what families thought, you know, to the point where, yeah, maybe there's one example of one dowry, but in, you know, 5,000 years, that's not many. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, so we don't really know about how it starts, but then marriage is marriage. And so mm -hmm. you have your wide variety of marriages. Some right. were loving and wonderful. Some were arranged. Some were terrible. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, 
So, but did you want to talk about? No, I was just going to talk about how it's mainly people living together. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> right. um, yeah, but the one thing that women could do is like not only do they have control over their house, but they did have rights in their marriage too. Like they were able to divorce their husbands if they didn't like them. They were able to own property. So they could own a house, they could own specific property within the house, and they could actually choose in a will who would in fact get their property. So there's this one really fantastic will of a woman by the name of Naunacht, who must have been wonderful in many ways. <laughs> she hated some of her kids. And <laughs> so she actually wrote a, a government endorsed will that was totally legal that said that she was going to disinherit certain children and give everything to its other children. Uh -huh. um, and that, you know, but it would just be her portion of the product. So even the disinherited one, like they'd still get the father's uh -huh. line, but not her stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they did have rights mm -hmm. more than the rest of the ancient world. So speaking of, you know, inheritance, were they also able to like, let's say like from their father or like their family, were they able to also inherit lands too? Yes, I I would need to double check the okay. Wilbur Papyrus and other key documents, but I believe we do have cases where women were landowners. Caveat, hashtag, let me look it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're getting a little close to the end, so we're going to kind of switch gears one last time um, and kind of going back to royalty. I think whenever people think about ancient Egypt, particularly women, two come to mind. Um, and that would be Hatshepsut and Cleopatra. And there's very good reasons. You know, they were very powerful pharaohs. Um, so, you know, when we look at pharaohs, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it seems like that role was designed with the male in mind. Like, you know, you've got the false beard, you know, just the whole position was centered around, you know, being male. Um, and granted, like there's other examples of female pharaohs, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so why was it that these two women in particular, um, I don't know if we want to split this up, like maybe. Can I give some background to yes, this stuff? Please. Okay, before we jump into Hatshepsut and Cleopatra, you do need to know that there are a number of other women who were male, uh, sorry, female kings, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this usually happens at the end of dynasties or when children become uh, or when children become king. Um, and so it, you know, we, it might even happen as early as the first dynasty with Merenith or Kenti Kawas, Sobek Nefru, you know, Hatshepsut, Nefertiti, we could talk about her, or, you know, uh, Tawasret and, and a couple of others. But it, all, it usually happens when the male line is either dead or three years old. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and even without that, right, um, and Hatshepsut is a special case because she's awesome, but <laughs> even before then, it's very common for kids to come to the throne in ancient Egypt. Um, and you can let a child be the king. He can go through the ceremonies, he can, you know, walk through the temple and give something to a god, but you usually don't want a five-year-old running a government or a nine-year-old running the government as in the case of King Tut. So in those cases, you need a regent to actually like do the hard work. And in almost every case, the regent of a child is going to be the kid's biological mother. And the idea is, is that the biological mother is the only person who is loyal enough to her kid so that when the kid becomes an adult, you know, like the ripe old age of 15, 16 in ancient <laughs> Egypt, then you would just happily turn the government over to your smart 15 year old <laughs> um, and say, here, son, run these things for me. Um, and, and so like there was this mechanism of women in power, at least power behind the throne for a kid. And this is very weird to Egyptian kingship and actually shows how strong Egyptian kingship was because in a lot of other places in the world, like Mesopotamia and anywhere in Game of Thrones, right? Like the moment the kid becomes king, they're dead and right. somebody else takes it as an advantage. Um, but not in Egypt, you know, like child rulers could actually like grow up from two years old. They had that stability because of kingship. So when you have cases like Hatshepsut and Cleopatra, it has to be in that context. So do you want to talk about Hatshepsut? Yeah, so I like Hatshepsut and I think she's cool just because of how she came to power. So she was, um, she acted as a regent for her nephew, but 
she I thought it was I think it's cool that she was the regent for her nephew instead of her nep or instead of the nephew's biological mother because she was able to like work around the system and claim like that her bloodline is superior because not only was she also married to her brother but she was her father's daughter mm -hmm. who was like his grandfather it's kind of weird it's a weird family tree but <laughs> I think that it's really cool how she was able to like find that loophole and use her own like bloodline and power and not even have to focus and worry about or claim that she was like one of the queens like she's like I am my father's daughter I can be this person's regent and then they're like oh yeah, yeah you can be the regent and then it just it slowly grows to where she's like okay we're regents we're regent and they I don't think she ever diminished her nephew as like a king they've always they are always co-kings or once he gets old enough, they are co they are co kings, but she is still able to stay in power and use her bloodline to keep that power mm -hmm. and keep going. And then I also think it's kind of cool how there's like still controversy around her. And I there was a graffiti that you showed in your class towards the end where there was I'm not gonna I mean I kind of brought it up, but I think it's cool that that's one example of um, <laughs> people speaking out against mm -hmm. the pharaoh it's a provocative graffiti oh. of Hatshepsut so I think that it's an interesting example uh, of yeah. <laughs> people speaking out against the pharaoh because you don't really hear that happening right in ancient Egypt it's especially kind of if like, the pharaoh's a god you, yeah like, you don't... like everyone agrees with the pharaoh and thinks he's cool but like Hatshepsut is the one I mean I, I'm sure there's others but that's the one that I remember the most <laughs> so Cleopatra yeah <laughs> No, Hatshepsut is very cool, but she she should have been king had she been male in every way. And she was the most powerful woman around. So she was very much because she was both the god's wife of Amun. So she had the main priest title in the entire, entire known world at that time. And she was the daughter of the king, wife of her brother, who was a king. It was pretty easy for her to tell, you know, the secondary wife, mother of Tutmosis III, to go away and take on that role of regent. Um, but she was a great leader, a very strong domestic leader that ended up running, ruling for like 20 some years. Mm -hmm. And actually, Egypt was really strong at that time, too, which is not Cleopatra. So my transition was terrible. <laughs> uh, but Cleopatra is a totally different case, right? Because this is, you know, 1400 years later. She um, by that point, um, many different people had taken over Egypt, and you had this long line from the time of Alexander the Great in 332 BC up until, you know, well, the death of Cleopatra in 30 BC, that the country is being run by what's called the Ptolemaic kings. They are all Ptolemies. Um, they are Greek Macedonians because Ptolemy was a general of Alexander the Great. So it's when the Greeks are essentially ruling over Egypt, even though they're technically separate from Greece, but that's another story. Um, so you have this multicultural time, and there are actually a lot of really powerful and cool queens that come up through that period. In fact, Cleop the famous Cleopatra is actually Cleopatra the Seventh. So there were six others, and then a whole bunch of Arsinoes and like other very, very cool people. And that time in history has a lot of crazy stuff going on. Anyway, when Cleopatra um, comes to the throne, she's actually made immediately co-king with her younger brother. Um, and that's because they were both the child of t uh, children of Ptolemy the 12th, but they hated each other. Like they, they fought all the time. They didn't want to be kings together. So it's like Egypt was almost in a standoff between, I don't know, 17 year old Cleopatra and 13 year old Ptolemy the 13th. Right? So they were like bickering siblings basically. Yeah. But then they'd take the entire country into it and start a battle, like an <laughs> actual war. <laughs> um, and the way that Cleopatra got the upper hand over her, you know, younger twat brother um, was because of Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar came to Egypt and she, you know, had an affair with him and had a child with him, Caesarian, um, who she was grooming to be the next king of Egypt <clears throat> until he was killed. Um, <laughs> but then it was Julius Caesar showing Roman power, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's a, he's the a great Roman, um, uh, well, not emperor yet, but he was a god. Uh, we're building up to that. <laughs> anyway, he was the one that's like, no, Cleopatra's going to be king of Egypt, Ptolemy, 13th, go away. Mm -hmm. um, meaning be killed. <laughs> um, and then and then even after, you know, Julius Caesar was killed um, in 44 BC, you know, then she started an affair slash marriage slash mother of four children with Mark Antony. 
and Mark Antony um, was part of the second triumvirate who was, you know, taking over Rome at the time. And so that was a really strong, actually probably loving relationship. Like he ran off from his wife in Rome, uh, who by the way, was the sister of Octavian. <laughs> it's very, very messy. Um, watch Rome on HBO. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, and read the books, of course. <laughs> so anyway, she ended up, they, they probably had a pretty loving relationship. I mean, Mark Antony basically wanted to move to Egypt. But what ended up having uh, happening is that he lost the Battle of Actium to Octavian, who is the last of the two remaining triumvirates. Um, and when he lost to Octavian slash Agrippa, um, that was basically it. You know, like he died, Cleopatra killed herself. You know, like everything was done. And with that loss, Egypt became part of the Roman emperor and part of Octavian's personal empire. And Octavian then became Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. So like the death of Cleopatra is pivotal for the entire Roman emperor and what goes on for the next, you know, four or 500 years over right. in Rome and with Egypt then being the breadbasket of the entire country. That being said, even though Rome has taken, now taken over uh, Egypt, the Romans still portray themselves as kings, as, as emperors, um, mm. as actual pharaohs, sorry, pharaohs of Egypt. And they continue the temples and everything for mm -hmm. another 300 years or so. Yeah. So yeah. I think, you know, that's definitely like the big finale ending. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's a very, definitely a very interesting time in history. So I feel like that's probably a really good place to leave it. Um, so thank you both of you so much for joining me today for this conversation. I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot. Um, and thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope you guys actually made it this far. Um, so if you did, please leave a like, I guess, because we're on YouTube. <laughs> Um, and I hope you guys check out and YouTube. subscribe and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> You'll doing the whole like like YouTube. subscribe and see below. <laughs> what is it? Smash that like button. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining me, and I hope to get see you guys in the next episode. So have a good day, and thank you everyone.